Uh, time for another draft physics.com, debate physics.com also. But websites are sort of irrelevant on the new internet. You know, the information superhighway really doesn't map any of these kind of websites. So, absolutely no um, referrals from any search engines. Nothing. So, um, everything sort of has to be generated, that is, any eyeballs and interest through these YouTube videos. And clearly, YouTube isn't big on uh, promoting these small channels in any way, um, keeping them as obscure and invisible as possible. And uh, so, it's difficult. So, I have attempted to break that ice. Uh, you know, that cold internet, uh, by offering uh, channels lots of money, frankly, pretty good punk of money, for a minor bit of participation in a science debate. And uh, you'd think they'd want to do that on their own, that these subjects would be um, interesting. So, um, there have been a few examples. I mean, Veritasium's claim that electricity doesn't travel through wires and he got away with it, okay. Uh, the, whatever, the wind car, another Veritasium provoked uh, discussion, you could call it almost. Um, you know, not resolved, frankly. I mean, in the sense that the answers provided by, I think everyone, are funny, they're just wrong. <laughs> okay, the whole trick is the fact that he's changing the pitch on the blades, which means the blades are not propellers. If you take the pitch off of a blade, it's not a propeller anymore. It doesn't push wind. It just spins. Anyway, um, you know, one of the most glaring of the facts was pretty much ignored through that whole conversation with all these other channels. Anyway, um, <clears throat> so there's not much debate. And now there'll be some people who do some historical debating with themselves. They'll talk about past physics debates like wave particle duality or Einstein versus Bohr or something like that. Um, but they won't actually debate the physics um, <coughs> or honestly even describe um, the s condition of the evidence. Uh, which, you know, I demonstrated in the last video where I, uh, well, a couple of videos ago, um, Science Asylum guy who not only said that Newton said 9.8 meters per second squared when he didn't say that. <laughs> it's 9.8 meters per second. It's not per second squared. As <clears throat> he didn't say per second per second because, well, he didn't think people were as dumb as he, apparently you people are <laughs> now that you'd have to even suggest that, yeah, it can happen for more than one second. And that more than one second means you square the seconds, which is just illogical mush. I mean, I shouldn't even have to debate how big a cheat that is and how big a lie it is. So, um, clearly, you know, it's a reasonable thing to debate is the fact that, you know, the people defending conventional physics, conventional physics, the standard model, is Leibnizian physics. Okay, and they don't even call themselves Leibnizians. You know, they don't give the man who invented their theory any credit at all, which is surprising. They don't even know his name, most of them. Um, and they keep lying, trying to imply that somehow the Leibnizian physics that is Newtonian physics, when Newton directly opposed the physics. Newton was directly opposed to it. Um, Newton believed in three-dimensional space. He didn't believe there was a time dimension. He didn't believe there was a fourth dimension or a fifth dimension or any of that crap. And that everything um, basically had to move through the three physical dimensions. And you could understand all of the rules that govern how things move in those three dimensions. And you don't need any frames and you don't need any relativity and you don't need any of that mush. Um, but that's never been hashed out, debated. Um, certainly not in the, in the last uh, 50 years has <laughs> have they been willing, physicists been willing to engage in a debate about any of these subjects. So anyway, in trying to provoke that, 
um, in the sense that, uh, you know, look, I started this because of uh, more of a unification idea that the you can understand the universe as being made of discrete elements and um, that the discrete elements are just in one universe, the small universe, and it's pretty much governed by really simple rules. I mean, I called it 2 plus 2 plus 2 physics because there's just two kinds of force and two kinds of matter, electrons and protons, and they do all the stuff that becomes the universe through two interactions, essentially, repulsion and attraction. Um, and, yeah. can't debate that though <laughs> okay so so um so yeah the only hope here i suppose is you know to generate some sort of interest through some sort of um i don't know i, I i'm frankly i'm not gonna pay google i'm not, I'm not gonna i'm not gonna buy ads <laughs> you know it just seems outrageously silly um that the internet should go back to working that badly i mean that's like I mean, I, you know, I was part of the the force that prevented Microsoft and these big corporations from destroying the internet, and um, in the past. And so, why should I now concede and just become um, owned by all of those um, <coughs> mechanisms that shouldn't exist? Um, so, yeah, I really just can't see that happening. Um, so what's the alternative? It just has to be that the people who incidentally or now and then see one of these videos, they have to be motivated um, to um, argue. Now there's been a couple of people that show up and, you know, they, <coughs> you know, I'm not gonna, I don't wanna, you know, discount their participation, but I mean, it is kind of weak. Um, it's like this uh, bass and bass guy, you know, He's, he'll, he'll essentially waste some of his time uh, attempting to argue with a few of the, um, the opponents that don't, aren't able to articulate arguments. So they can't make arguments, they can't draw pictures, they can't do force diagrams, they can't explain their theory, they just didn't, you know, they just state it and then contrive some crappy little experiment to say, look, see, I proved it. Um, because I rub two sticks together or some kind of bullshit. Anyway, but so, so here's a, you know, typical, there's a, <laughs> there are different videos I've seen recently that demonstrate the faster you go, the less gravity has time to affect you. Well, it'd be nice if you would have saved the links, it'd be nice if you posted them somewhere, you get something. Just stating it doesn't help much, right? <laughs> Cars driving over potholes at different speeds, for example, yeah. Um... I mean, it's not really an argument that should have to be argued very difficult. You know, why should this even be an argument, frankly? I don't think there's anybody who's got a college degree who can't figure out that you can slide across thin ice by effectively reducing your weight per second, your weight per time, per unit of time, you're applying less weight to the ice, and therefore the ice doesn't break. I mean shouldn't have to explain that. I shouldn't have to really explain to anybody with a college degree that I can make lifting something more work by lifting it really slowly. You know, the slower I lift it, the more work I'm going to do. I'm going to sweat more, I'm going to burn more calories, I'm going to have to do more work. And why? Because time's really important to the function of gravity. It's not a, uh, it's not incidental, it's fundamental. That should be a valid argument, and people should be able to make their counter arguments, but they can't make any that are reasonable or rational. So, uh, yeah, so it's just not a good atmosphere, <laughs> frankly. Um, so I don't know what to do about it yet. I haven't decided what the plan is, but I've got to be able to initiate some sort of debate, and I think the debate will be interesting. Um, I think people, uh, underneath it all, once they realize they have been lied to, that the stories told by physics aren't real stories, they're just bullshit, most of it, um, that they never proved any of this stuff, they never had a ton of evidence, none of that crap happened. The Eddington experiment's a perfect example. I don't think, again, a college graduate could come up with any kind of reasonable excuse 
why in the last 50 years we've been in space they haven't attempted the Eddington experiment. You don't need an eclipse. It takes five minutes, literally five minutes of satellite time. Um, you know, it's just a, a no-brainer that you would redo it. 400 times better resolution in space. A 400 times better <laughs> capacity to see. I mean, it's that's a gigantic amount. Um, and, you know, to say it's never been even attempted, it's just, obviously you can't make any sense out of that. Uh, and the fact that they won't even concede, I think, like I said, anybody honest is going to say, yeah, okay, that's a good point. I mean, why are they saying that it's uh, valid and it's proven when, gee, they, you know, and with all of this technology, they haven't bothered to confirm <coughs> one of the most important um, experiments in defining Einstein's theories. I mean, Einstein wouldn't be so, much of anything if it wasn't for the Eddington experiment. It's what made Einstein famous, um, really famous. So, I mean, it's just, it's what made his theories believable. And, um, you know, and it is kind of garbage science. And it won't even be accurately described. Again, the Science Asylum guy described it as if Einstein predicted um, light is bent as much as a squirrel is bent by gravity. And that's not what he predicted. That's not what he stated. He stated it's bent twice as much. That light bends twice as much as material objects when placed in a gravitational field. And it's a bold assertion. And um, to have mush as evidence and that's all they have I mean these are these are very debatable subjects so I've gone into these details I mean all of these little experiments that contradict each other about momentum versus kinetic energy and I can argue that in some cases the evidence in my opinion is so decisive the the space examples where um, kinetic energy won't move matter in space so, um, you know, they're basically saying that uh, the wattage doesn't mean anything, that heat doesn't mean anything. Um, what they claim that the, the calculated amount of energy that something has doesn't really mean anything because in the, the end, the only thing that's going to matter is how much mass is it and how fast is it moving. And it's, there's not going to be any squared function and none of that stuff's going to be true. Um, and that's a pretty strong piece of evidence, and it's one that certainly should make reasonable people say this is something worth pursuing, this is something worth picking at a little harder, because um, there shouldn't be contradictions and paradoxes in the physics evidence. <sighs> now, as I've stated, all of this you can start with Leibniz, you know, and his silly notion that lifting four pounds one foot is the is same energy required as lifting one pound four feet when obviously if you drop those two objects one of them will fall in twice the time not four times the time and in dropping four times the time twice the time with only one unit of mass it's only going to have twice the velocity and it's not going to be the same energy um, you know provable testable and then the de Chardelet clay experiments where round objects were used to dent clay and presume that there's a linear relationship when obviously there's nothing very linear about a circle, <laughs> the shape of a circle. You know, all this stuff's really pretty easy to understand why there's um, problems with the theories they're arguing are the truth and the fact that nobody will debate it. I mean, I can't get anyone to participate in a argument, counter-argument. I mean, I can't get them to make response videos. I make all these five-minute videos. I can't get them to make response videos to any of them. And certainly there's nobody willing to, you know, in a live conversation, uh, debate these aspects of physics and the evidence that physics has. Um, and uh, the credibility of the statements based on that evidence and uh, nothing.
no one willing to defend their theory, okay? <laughs> which is something like, I suppose, that are, you know, uh, it's probably pretty hard for an evolutionist to get a, you know, a Christian to sh show up at a debate, you know, r arguing the scientific facts, um, because, yeah, they can't make any counter-argument. And I think the, this is pretty much the same circumstance as regular physics isn't science anymore. It's just a religion. It's a bunch of dogmatic statements they say are true. They must be believed. <coughs> they are uh, unchallengeable axioms. Uh, so you have to accept that time is a dimension. You have to accept that there's no such thing as real motion in the universe, that everything is doing some sort of relativity thing where you know they can warp that time dimension and pretend they can be in the same space at the same time all kinds of nonsense uh certainly unproven nonsense and then you'd you know that's not even touching the entanglement and dark matter and dark energy and all the other mush they waste time on even simple subjects could be debated you know how photons travel through space and that uh you know if there is redshift you know, from distant objects that it would be explainable as the fact that the light is actually physically encountering some matter as it travels billions of light years, that it doesn't get a free ride. It doesn't just travel through empty space, completely empty. It travels through space that does have a lot of crap in it, and that interacting with that crap changes its frequency. Um, uh, expands its wavelength tires the light perfectly reasonable explanation uh, and really no counter evidence there's certainly no evidence that proves that can't be true I mean they're certainly not going to prove there's no um, molecular hydrogen in space and that uh, light isn't necessary you know, that light wouldn't probabilistic over <laughs> billions of light years it would be pretty probabilistic that it would hit some of that stuff. All right. Uh, you know, that should be another argument that's almost like you're saying it shouldn't even take place. But they, they, won't even, they won't even suggest that there could be an alternative explanation besides their wooey explanations, um, you know, of magic, frankly. Uh, and that's, that's all it is. <laughs> you know, they don't really provide any physical explanation uh, why distance would create redshift. Uh, so anyway, um, so I'm just just making a video to say maybe I won't be making videos for a while. Maybe I'm, I'm just deciding what to do. Uh, I still think it's worth engaging with the the few little morons that there are in this little group of people. Um, you know, they, I mean, right now they're arguing. I guess I could do that. I'll just throw some physics in this video. Um, you know, uh, arguing over uh, how how much of a spring uh, a hunk of Play-Doh is. You know, whether it behaves as a perfect spring or not. <laughs> you know, in terms of how it absorbs energy, and uh, you know, and versus clay, and whether clay is a more perfect representor of energy. Um, you know, it's just a pretty th pathetic argument, uh, frankly. Um, but, then, you know, it's worth all having these arguments. Uh, it's just unfortunate that they can't have them in the same form where they actually explain how their physics functions um, with, you know, reasonable drawings of the dynamics. Uh, you know, some kind of way of understanding the origin, the place it stores, the where is the energy, what form is it in, how, you know, is it, how, what are the electrons and protons doing so that this energy can be in this object in this magical way, uh, you know, all that crap. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, you know, I, the point is, is to encourage the debate, so I have to be more aggressive, I guess, and finding somebody who can actually perform, okay, the function of, um, you know, doing a Skype call or, uh, you know, even a telephone call, I guess will work, uh, you know, have to have the video, 
um, you know, to, to, you know, have the debate and, you know, have some sort of show where um, people interested in physics can participate and make arguments relevant to physics. Um, because that's sort of the problem, too. The current players can't do much else but, you know, invade your personal life and, you know, make all kinds of silly stories, make up all kinds of lies about who you are and what you've done in your life and all that kind of crap. They won't argue the physics, so they just try to do some sort of character assassination because they can't argue the physics, and, you know, that's quite pitiful. Uh, so, all right, so let's argue the one of the current... So they're fighting among themselves over this one, which is a little bit funny. So we'll do some of that just to throw something in this video. But again, it's there's just no point. There's just too small an audience. Um, there's not enough participants who know any physics. Uh, they can't argue any physics. Um, so you know they can't argue the history. They don't know any of the history. Uh, so you know it's it's just really quite futile. Uh, in the current existing context, having these arguments. So, <coughs> now I'd argue this, uh, clearly this is what Newton believed, and it's what I believe, so I'm just stating it to be clear, that momentum does rule. Momentum is energy. That's essentially what Newton said, is force equals momentum. And he made it clear in the sense that he said, look, you apply twice the force to something, you're going to get twice the velocity. But you're not going to change its mass. You're just going to change its velocity. So the quantity will always be the same. The force is essentially interchangeable with momentum. It can be understood. And I would argue it goes a step further to point out that weight is just the same thing. Weight is just momentum. You're being moved by gravity. That movement has a consequence. All right, so I mean, I should point out again that, you know, just something so simple that physics has never done. I mean, an experiment so simple, you know, where they've never taken an object, turned a scale on its side, okay, can still measure weight, you know, tip sideways, scales still work. Isn't that amazing? Did you know that, that scales still work as scales, you know, even when they're sideways? It's just that you have to apply the force in a different way now. You can't just let gravity do it. You have to make the force. Um, and that physics has never found out, it's there a speed I can move an object. And it doesn't matter what the object is. It doesn't matter how big it is. It doesn't matter how small it is. And I can bang it with a velocity into a scale. And the scale will read, it's instantaneous for a moment, it will read a pressure that will equal its mass. So, no matter what its mass is, is there a velocity I can move it at that it will read its mass? And there is, and it's one mile an hour. Okay, one mile per hour. That's the, so right around there. And that equals pretty much one centimeter of falling time. So, in one centimeter of falling time, you'll reach one mile an hour when you hit a scale. And that's essentially what you're already doing in gravity. So when I give you one centimeter, I'm essentially doubling your weight. You'll weigh not only your gravitational weight from um, just the scale having to stop you from moving, but you'll weigh this little extra bit that you added. This little extra bit of velocity will be exactly the same as your original weight. And so you'll weigh twice the mass. All right. <laughs> and if I go four times that height, I will now increase your mass again, double the mass you had at that one centimeter point, and so on and so on. So there's a simple experiment where you can take a two mass object and a one mass object, and you drop it four times the distance, and the fact is it'll be in the gravity twice the time. So this will be in one unit of time, this will be in twice the amount of time. So you could argue it's going to collect twice the gravity, okay, but it's half the mass. So it's only going to collect half as much. And that these two things are, in fact, equal. That because of this twice the time and half the mass, you're going to have the, you know, it's twice the time, twice the velocity when it hits the ground, and twice the weight, okay. 
so all these twos are a gigantic giveaway um, and you can understand that it would be twice if it wasn't for the fact that the mass is half so half the mass times twice the velocity you know equals the same thing all right so they're doing this experiment and in one case they're using play-doh okay and when they did it the first time the guy did it the first time he claimed it came out that these two things are equal it came out Newton's way all right that the fact is that this is the same impact energy the same weight so a two mass dropped one unit of distance weighs the same puts the same force on an object as a one mass drop four times the distance um, now the trick is you do have to subtract the original mass because you're really trying to measure what did this add what did the falling add so you have to subtract the original weight because obviously the two mass does weigh twice as much as the one mass so the scale is going to be pushed less here than it was pushed here but anyway uh, but for all intents and purposes he got the equal result and uh, found it very dissatisfying really couldn't figure out why it came out that way so he redoes the experiment now and now he gets a new result okay so for some reason oh his old result he's getting a new result and so now the the new result says that there's a, a 1.4 change so this the lighter object as now compressing the Play-Doh 1.4. So even though it was even before, now it's 1.4. Okay, for Play-Doh. All right. Um, and you know they think this 1.4 number means something because that's the square root of two, and so therefore it's kinetic energy and blah blah blah. And this has twice the kinetic energy or something, and that twice the kinetic energy looks like 1.4 the velocity which still doesn't make any sense because we're talking about collecting the energy we're not talking about measuring velocities we're looking to collect the energy All right. uh, so it should have twice the energy by the kinetic energy theory but it only came out 1.4 because they're basically saying the, the play-doh is reactive and I would have argued that maybe it is I mean play-doh does bounce um, play-doh doesn't like faster speed so the faster you hit it you could almost argue that it's the same as um, cornstarch so if you take liquid cornstarch and put it in a bucket the faster you hit it the less you go through it it'll firm up become very solid and it's very hard to compress once you've it's hard to move once you have uh, impacted it quickly but if you move slowly through it no problem so it has a huge bias for velocity now you could argue maybe Play-Doh has some of that bias and the faster you're going the more it resists the more the Play-Doh binds to the other molecular molecules and it moves less freely possible theory all right so then the other guy does it in clay okay and he argues he's getting 1.8 all right so he's getting almost the um, two to one relationship so he's now now we're there up to 1.8 more compression for the lighter object that was only in the gravity twice as long <laughs> okay by their theory it doesn't have twice the weight it has four times the weight all right uh, and so um, it just hasn't been realized yet um, so, you know, valid arguments but again what's the theory of it how can it possibly be true this would be the sensible argument. So we know if we go twice the velocity at liftoff here, we know we're only going this high. That's it. You know, it's not like we can expect to get anything more out of the the projectile's movement. Um, so again, it's almost all the way back to an argument about something as simple as just putting weight on a scale. You know, that I could have a scale, and it takes one unit of work to slide this let's say I had to lift it up here All right so I had to lift it a little bit then I can slide it onto a scale and it weighs one and their argument is if I do exactly the same thing okay with another brick exactly the same weight and I lift it exactly the same height and I slide it onto the scale now it'll weigh four so that's their theory 
that if I put one thing on, it's the same, it weighs one, and if I put two on, it weighs four, really. But somehow it's real weight. That I've done three times the work here that I did here. Even though it's the same work, I did three times the work on the scale. The scale now has stored four times the energy. So it only stored one unit of energy when I put one on, but when I put the second one on, it stored three units of energy. Even though it's the same exact material, same object. I mean, that kind of stuff is just so nonsensical that it almost shouldn't be argued. But the fact is, you do have these results, you do have these experiments, and they do have to be picked at. And that's the process where there should be more participants in that argument. But none of them can do any of this drawing thing and explain how twice the time can somehow produce four times the gravitational influence. All right, anyway, the gravitational force. Uh, all right, so, like I said, we'll see where it goes, but yes, it's just gotten um, sort of pointless, right? I mean, it, it, the, the world will not have the conversation in its current form, okay? There's not enough people who care. The very few people who might get here don't find it compelling or interesting. Um, and so, therefore, it's not going to get talked about. It's not going to be referenced. It's not going to go anywhere. So until that changes, the videos are a little bit uh, pointless. You <laughs> know, a waste of time. All right. So anyway, till the next time and such and so forth and whatnot.